welcome to this webinar from the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect. This is a webinar designed for those working in human rights, peace building and atrocity prevention, as well as anyone interested in better understanding sexual and gender based mass atrocity crimes. We are very excited to have Deputy Director of the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, Dr Sarah Tate, delivering this webinar today. Hello, today I'm going to be doing a brief webinar on understanding sexual and gender based mass atrocity crimes. Uh, I am the Deputy Director of the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect and this webinar series is part of the Center's um, webinars on the Responsibility to Protect in the current global context. So for this webinar, what I wanted to do to start off with was just to talk a little bit about what we're talking about when we talk about mass atrocity crimes, and then specifically go into what are the sexual and gender-based acts or elements of mass atrocity crimes. So when we think about mass atrocity crimes, we're thinking about four key crimes, and these are the crimes that the international community agreed to protect their populations from and to mobilize the international community to prevent and protect populations from at the 2005 World Summit in the principle of the responsibility to protect. The responsibility to protect says states have a responsibility to protect their own populations from these four crimes, a duty of international assistance, and the responsibility for the international community to take action when states are manifestly failing to protect their populations. So when we think about the four crimes that are part of the R2P framework, these are genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing. Genocide is defined under the 1948 Genocide Convention. This outlaws crimes that are committed with the intent to, to destroy in in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. The Genocide Convention also has a legal obligation to prevent and punish this, these types of crimes. So, for example, a recent initiative under the Genocide Convention is the case of the Gambia, a country from Africa who is a signatory to the Genocide Convention, bringing a case against the government of Myanmar, also a signatory to the Genocide Convention, in the International Court of Justice for the government of Myanmar's actions against the Rohingya population, specifically alleging that the clearance operations of 2017 um, constituted acts of genocide and because both of these states are signatories to the Genocide Convention and the Genocide Convention has a legal obligation to prevent and punish crimes, that the Gambia could bring this case to the International Court of Justice. War crimes are crimes against the laws of war. The laws of war are those that are defined in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, the 1977 Protocols thereto, and customary international law and the Rome Statute of the ICC. I should also say that genocide is also defined under the Rome Statute of the ICC, but it just replicates the language of the 1948 Genocide Convention. When we think about war crimes, we're thinking about the protections that are for the wounded and sick, prisoners of war, non-combatants, often called civilians, the principles of civilian immunity under um, the laws of war, the protection of medical personnel and humanitarian workers. Crimes against humanity are acts that are part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population. I'll go into this a little bit more detail later, but these are typically defined by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Ethnic cleansing is not an independent crime in and of itself. That is, it's not legally codified under international law, but it acts of ethnic cleansing may constitute crimes against humanity or war crimes. When we think about the particular sexual and gender-based elements of atrocity crimes, we need to think about these as two categories. Gender-based crimes um, uh, being a broader category and a subset of that is sexual crimes. So gender-based crimes are legally prohibited acts that are perpetrated against persons, whether male, female, or non-binary, based on their sex and or their gender. Sexual crimes are a subset of gender-based crimes. These are acts of a sexual nature perpetrated against a person by threat of force or coercion. Sexual gender-based crimes are outlawed under various international law and international jurisprudence. They're defined as well under the Security Council Resolution 1820, which holds that rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or constitutive acts with respect to genocide. 
Also very helpfully in June 2014, the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court issued a policy paper on sexual and gender-based crimes, basically outlining what is the existing jurisprudence and the um, status of sexual and gender-based crimes when we think about atrocities, when we think about war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. So for sexual and gender-based violence or sexual and gender-based crimes as an act of genocide, if we look at the, the Geneva Convention of 1948 and the language that was replicated in the Rome Statute of, of the International Criminal Court, rape and other forms of sexual violence are not expressly mentioned in either of these documents under the definition of genocide. However, international tribunals have ruled that sexual violence can qualify as a constitutive act of genocide when carried out with this very important definition of genocide with the intent to destroy a targeted group. A very important early case for this, the first, the sort of landmark case was the prosecutor versus Akiyesu. This was in September 1998, and this was the trial chamber one of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. This found that sexual violence was an integral part of the process of destruction of the Tutsi group. The ICTR ruled that sexual violence qualifies as an act of genocide by inflicting serious bodily and mental harm imposing conditions calculated to bring about the physical destruction of a group, of a specifically protected group. So this is when mass rape is used to, with the intent to destroy a community, to expel victims from communities. It can be a constitutive act of genocide by preventing births. So either through sexual mutilation, sterilization, or first birth control when it's particularly targeted against one of those protected groups. The other element of this can be the forcible transfer of children from one group to another. And this is particularly, and this is what the trial chamber one of the ICTR found, in patriarchal societies where a child's identity is determined by the identity of the father, forced pregnancy through rape can constitute an act of genocide when the intent is to give birth to a child who will consequently not belong to its mother's group. And so just to summarize that, if we think about the legal basis, the definition, and some of the guidance that has been offered by the prosecutor of the ICC. We see, again, the legal basis being in the 1948 Genocide Convention and the Rome Statute of the ICC. Genocide being acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. These are what they call the protected groups under the Genocide Convention. The prosecutor of the ICC has determined in this guidance note that SGBV can be an integral part of the pattern of destruction inflicted upon targeted groups. She drew on the jurisprudence that I just outlined above, like the Akiyesu cases, but many other cases as well. According to the prosecutor of the ICC, all acts of genocide, killing, causing serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting conditions calculated to physically destroy a group, imposing measures intended to prevent the birth within a group, or forcibly transferring children from a group, may have a sexual and gender element. That is to say that if people are killed, tortured, destroyed, particularly because of sexual and gender attributes, that may have to constitute sexual and gender-based um, acts of genocide. When it comes to war crimes, again, these are grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and other serious violations of the laws of war. When we go back and look at the Geneva Conventions, we see Article 3, which um, outlaws outrages upon personal dignity, in particular, humiliating and degrading treatment. Article 27 of the Fourth Geneva Convention says women shall be especially protected against any attack on their honor, in particular against rape and forced prostitution and any form of indecent assault. 1977, the additional protocols said women and children shall be the object of special respect and shall be protected from indecent assault. So it's out outlawing rape, forced prostitution, and any other form of indecent assault, particularly against women and children. The Geneva Conventions are replicated in part in, in the Rome Statute of the ICC, but it also has a more robust or broader definition of rape and sexual violence. So we see the legal basis, again, in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, the 1977 additional protocols. But when we look at Rome Statute Articles 8, the ones that I outlined there, 8.2b12 and 6, 2e6, that we can see, sorry, 22 and 6, we can see that, that there is a definition of rape, sexual violence as committing rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, 
and forced sterilization or any other form of sexual violence also constituting a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions. The prosecutor of the ICC has also said that all other types of war crimes, including intentionally directing attacks against civilian populations, torture, mutilation, outrages upon personal dignity, or the recruitment of child soldiers may also constitute sexual and gender-based elements. So for crimes against humanity, just to go back again to this definition, these are widespread or systematic attacks targeted against any civilian population which are committed pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy to commit such attack. So one of the things that we think about when we, we look at the difference between crimes against humanity and say, for example, genocide and war crimes, is that, there, that although crimes against humanity, the characteristics of them are that they are widespread or systematic attacks and that they're linked to some sort of state policy, they don't have the same high bar as genocide in terms of showing the intent upon of, of the part of authorities to destroy a, a whole or a part of a group. It's enough that these attacks are widespread or systematic and they're linked to some sort of policy, but they don't have to have that, that really high determination of is there an intent to destroy a group. In the difference between crimes against humanity and war crimes is that although crimes against humanity can occur in the context of armed conflict, they don't necessarily need to occur in the context of armed conflict. That is, they can occur in times of so-called peace. Examples of this are crimes against humanity in North Korea, where widespread use of political prison camps can constitute crimes against humanity outside the context of armed conflict. We could also look at this as in terms of the mass detention of the Uyghur population in Western China, although it may also fulfill elements of the crime of genocide, that we can certainly see that the widespread and systematic nature of some of the abuses there um, would fall under the category of crimes against humanity. So when it comes to sexual and gender-based violence, Rome Statute Article 71G defines very similar to those acts that were defined under war crimes as crimes against humanity. So rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, or any other form of violence of comparable gravity. The Rome Statute Article 71H defines gender-based persecution as a crime against humanity. And I'll go into this a little bit more. And then finally, there's, there's human trafficking that's specifically listed within the Rome Statute. So human trafficking, particularly of women and children, can constitute an act of enslavement, which is a crime against humanity under Article 71C. There hasn't been a lot of jurisprudence around this of human trafficking as a crime against humanity, but it is there under the Rome Statute. So in addition, much like genocide and war crimes, the prosecutor has also had got given this guidance notes that say we should generally look at this as being that even, even those crimes that are not expressly sexual and gender based uh, of nature, that we can see other crimes that could have some of these elements. For example, sexual and gender based torture or other inhumane acts causing great suffering, serious injury to body or mental or physical health. This is a, listed as a crime against humanity and the prosecutor has said that sexual violence can constitute serious injury to body or mental or physical health. And then on top of that, a crime against humanity is the forcible deportation or transfer of a population in an area. And we can see that sexual violence can be part of this, that sexual violence used as a strategy for the crime against humanity of deportation and forcible transfer for the population. And this is generally what we think about the linkage between crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. And again, it's not required that each act of sexual violence is widespread or systematic to constitute crimes against humanity. It's just that it needs to be formed part of a widespread or systematic attack on a population. In this context, it means that every act does not have to be, for example, an act of mass rape but to say that an, a particular incident of rape or other form of sexual violence is part of a wider pattern of that violence in the context of that particular government strategy or government policy. Now, persecution is a really interesting crime against humanity, particularly in its gender provisions. It is the only atrocity crime that specifically prescribes attacking a person on the basis of gender. And the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC, for example, has analyzed whether the Taliban in Afghanistan and Boko Haram in Nigeria attacked women and girls because of their socially constructed gender roles. When she was looking for evidence of gender persecution, it is the extent to which other prohibited acts, kidnappings in the case of Boko Haram, rape or killings, was looking at specifically in relation to the Taliban, 
occurred because females were intentionally and severely deprived of fundamental rights by reason of their belonging to a group identifiable on gender grounds. Now this is potentially really groundbreaking because it suggests that the systematic discrimination or subjugation of women in society, the persecution of women, when it is, is uh, intersects with other forms of prohibited acts under the Rome Statute, that we could see crimes against humanity occurring specifically, say, against women because of that um, deep-seated persecution of them. Now, ethnic cleansing, as I said before, is not officially codified under international law but we do have some guidance on what it is by the UN. In particular, ethnic cleansing entered our international discourse in the early 1990s from the conflict in former Yugoslavia, when it was used as a strategy to clear populations from a particular area. So the UN Commission of Experts on the War in Former Yugoslavia defined ethnic cleansing as rendering an area ethnically homogenous by using force or intimidation to remove persons of a given group from the area. The same commission of experts recognized that rape and sexual violence can be acts of ethnic cleansing. That is, sexual violence can be one of the coercive measures used to forcibly displace or remove given groups from an area. But just to reiterate in terms of advocacy, advocacy that is linked most closely to definitions of international law would link this to a crime against humanity. We talk about this with, the, with respect to forcible deportation or expulsion of groups, which is a crime against humanity, or the deliberate targeting of groups to destroy them, which can be an act of genocide. And we can look at ethnic cleansing as falling under those categories. And much of the jurisprudence around this has been the rape or sexual violence or other forms of gender-based violence that have been targeted to women and girls in particular. But it's really important to note that sexual gender-based violence against men and boys is also a really prevalent acts of atrocity crimes. So a, a really good example of this is the UN International Commission of Inquiry on Syria, which documented patterns of sexual violence perpetrated against women, men, boys, and girls. In its March 2018 report, it looked at the different repertoire or types of violence that are targeted at women and girls versus men and boys, noting that women and girls were much more likely to suffer sexual violence by government forces and associated militias during house raids and ground operations and at checkpoints, whereas in detention facilities, sexual violence was committed on a widespread basis against both males and females. Uh, the report found there were patterns of rape against women in 20 government political and military intelligence branches, while men were raped by object or suffered genital mutilation in 15 branches. This suggests that, again, that there's widespread forms of sexual violence against men committed in the context of atrocity crimes in Syria, but that the, the type of violence differs according to the different sexes. So men, were, we see really high prevalence of um, sexual violence in detention facilities against men and women, and different types of violence being used, sexual mutilation, rape by objects, for, versus other forms of violence against women. So it's just important to note that the high levels of sexual violence can vary according to both within specific contexts and across contexts. So if I'm just going to sort of summarize this up, this is a, a useful, I thought, infographic. It's a bit dated now, but it's still useful. From Women Under Siege, you'll notice that there's no um, examples there that are post-Arab Spring, but ne nevertheless, it gives you kind of a summary of some of the ways in which sexual and gender-based violence can be used as acts of atrocity. This is particularly talking about acts of, of war crimes, but we can look at it within the broader context of genocidal intent as well as crimes against humanity. The idea is that sexual violence is not just an attack on bodies, but an attack on people as constituting part of the enemy. And that gendered ideas of nationalism contribute to the attacks on, um, of sexual and gender-based violence. So this idea that women can be symbolic representations of a body politic, and that a rape of women is attack on the nation or attack on the ethnic group. Systematic rape can be used as a means to destroy ethnic groups and creating conditions of terror to facilitate ethnic cleansing. And finally, that the threat of sexual violence is used to control resources and exact information. And this is where we see, in particular, the exacting information where sexual violence is used with really high levels of sexual violence against men in detention facilities, in part, to humiliate and to exact information. But this is also against women and girls as well. 
So when we think about bringing gender analysis to the prevention of sexual and gender-based atrocity crimes, it is important to note that gender-based crimes include, but are not limited to sexual violence. There can also be this crime of gender persecution. Sexual crimes often entail physical violence, but can also include non-physical acts intended to punish, humiliate, or degrade persons, acts such as forced public nudity. If women, girls, men, or boys are targeted because of gender norms, these attacks even though they be non-sexual in nature, can be considered gendered crimes. Examples of this include sex-selected killings or attacks on lesbian, gay, or transgender people based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. The idea that if they are targeted specifically for some sort of sexual and gender-based reason, that these can be part of the body of evidence for gender-based atrocity crimes. Thank you for watching this webinar from the Asia-Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect.